Well, it's the start for a brand new year, which in Palo Alto means the election of a mayor and a vice mayor. And that took place this week. Uh, some drama uh, accompanied that. And so we'll talk about what that uh, new configuration of leadership portends for Palo Alto. Um, and then we'll re rewind the clock a bit to the evening of uh, December 25th um, and the incident involving a mentally ill man and the police and the tragic outcome of that. But um, let's start off first with the election of the mayor and the vice mayor. Last year's election of um, Holman and Karen Holman and Greg Schmidt was like two peas in a pod. And then this year we have the odd couple. So we have Pat Burt and Greg Scharf. Um, Janati, give us a little snapshot of what, what happened there and why there was some drama. Well, as you mentioned, um, Pat Burt was elected mayor uh, this week and um, Greg Scharf was elected vice mayor. And for many people who've watched those two interact uh, for the last, I don't know, since 2009, um, uh, it, it, it raised a few eyebrows because they've frequently clashed. They've often been on opposite sides of issues. They both have very strong, assertive personalities, so um, they aren't natural bedfellows. So it's, it was a little interesting to see the two of them get leadership positions while voting for each other. And it was also interesting to see um, a mayor elected by a 5-4 vote, which just doesn't yeah. happen in Palo Alto. It hasn't happened in a long time. Mm -hmm. Like even last year, where when, as you mentioned, mayor, mayor Hol Karen Holman got elected mayor, even that was you know unanimous. So this was 5-4, so it was a, a little more intriguing and suspense, suspenseful than in the past. Yeah. Um, last year was a strong residentialist year coming off of the 2014 election. Mm -hmm. um, and Pat Burt was aligned with uh, the four on the council um, who share those kind of slow growth mm -hmm. viewpoints. So the fact that the people who supported him for mayor were not those four, um, what was the kind of behind-the-scenes chatter about that? movement and how, how he, his election you know, came about, really? Well, the behind the, the scene chatter, I had a chance to speak to every council person since the election, and it sounds like um, he did align himself with residentialists like during the election to, in 2014. I mean, I remember going to the election party where uh, Tom Du Bois and Eric Filseth and Karen Holman were just elected, yeah. and Pat was there kind of introducing them. Were, I mean, he was clearly part of kind of coalition, faction, slate, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think his votes have always been much more nuanced. So he may have positioned himself with the residentialists, but uh, I wouldn't really put him in, into any camp. I feel like his voting record, for better or worse, I think it's a, it's a little harder to peg. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, the chatter before this particular election had him talking much more with the non-residentialists, mm -hmm. Greg Scharf, Liz Niss, Corey Wolbeck. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was kind of, in a sense, it was a bit of a reverse in alliances. Yeah. You, now, you um, face some reporting challenges um, just to kind of figure out what happened behind the scenes um, to figure out, because because of the Brown Act, mm -hmm. um, the state law, uh, the open meeting law, which um, basically says that on a council of nine, you can only, a council member can only talk to three other people about right. a particular um, agenda item that's coming up. Mm -hmm. So how did people behave <laughs> <laughs> in terms of figuring out who to talk to and who not to talk to, and, and uh, what were the challenges of observing the Brown Act. I feel like um, most council members took some precautions, uh, mostly successfully, <laughs> to avoid Brown Act violations. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a challenge figuring out whether they kept with the Brown Act laws. And I don't think it's anything having to do with Palo Alto or the city council in Palo Alto or the number of people. I think it's an inherent challenge in, in figuring out what people talk about in closed doors during mayoral, mayoral elections. Yeah. And uh, it's just kind of in, inherently, this is the kind of topic where I imagine it coming up in conversations throughout the year, at parties, at whatever, mm -hmm. and it's like, I feel like it's one of those things where, you know, if you're smart, and I assume, you know, these council members are smart enough not to meet with five people in a group and discuss it, <laughs> but through a combination of nods, winks, you know, occasional email from an intermediary, uh, it seems pretty clear, like, by the time it got to the Monday vote, people had a pretty good sense of what was going to happen. Yeah, so, see, that's the so, thing. So how did they behave? I think they behaved uh, how I would expect uh -huh. people to behave in a hot political contest behind closed doors. <laughs> Did you, did you get a feel, Janani, as to how it came about that Pat Burt's name was put in nomination for mayor at all? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it would have surprised anybody if there had been a single nomination for Greg Schmidt and a unanimous vote to make him mayor. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I asked Liz Niss that question because mm -hmm. she's the one that nominated him, right. and, which was another kind of 
eye opener. If there's one person with whom Pat Bird clashed more over the past year than Greg Sharp, it's Liz mm-hmm. Ness. But you know, the, the two go back a long way. I mean, as Liz Ness told me, he was once the chair of her campaign back in her mm-hmm. prior kind of uh, prior life on the council. Uh, she said that the reason she nominated him is because she found him to be the most electable, and that's the word he, uh, she used. Um, as far of all the council members, she seemed like he's the one most likely to kind of forge a consensus between these rival factions. There's some truth to that because he is kind of the most politically adroit. He could go from one camp to the other. So um, that's kind of the reasoning she gave. Um, he is the one most likely to, try, to get enough votes. But she wouldn't have put his name in nomination without, his, without talking to him, and I think your story reported she, that, she that they him. talked. Yeah, she and mentioned so, to me. He made a decision at that point that he was going to be willing to, to go against his colleagues, his residentialist colleagues, mm-hmm. and go head-to-head with Greg Schmidt. So I, I'm just wondering what his thinking was in that. What, it, what has he said about why he made that choice to accept the nomination from this? Well, um, I'm not sure if, uh, if he had a, like a distinct choice to go against his residential colleagues. I, I feel like everybody who's known Pat Bird kind of has been intimating for a while that he wants to be mayor again. And uh, I, I just... So it's driven by that desire to, yeah, in his last year in office, but, be mayor. But more, more to your question, though, I, I don't think his, his tie to the residentialist faction is that tight, that this would be such a huge consideration for him. I mean, he partied with them on election. He voted with them some of the time, but not all the time. There's been examples where he didn't. So um, I, I don't see the fact that he would have to vote against them as that big a deterrent and as it proved. It really wasn't that big a deterrent. One of the things that I found interesting that came out of your reporting was just the role of intermediaries and mm-hmm. the idea that there are people who are connected to the political infrastructure who aren't elected, who are kind of running around and mm-hmm. um, in some ways making things happen, making um, pitches known to certain council members. I think you were speaking with Mark Berman. Um, he said <laughs> <Yes>. that he... <laughs> well, it, yeah, I did speak to Mark Berman. And actually, even before the election, I was at City Hall just like talking to people in the audience, and they all were kind of expecting to be tightly contested. They, they, they clearly knew something. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, uh, and it seemed like it was based on conversations with council members and people who know council members. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did speak to Mark Berman, and Mark Berman uh, did, says he didn't speak to any of his colleagues. And I actually believe him because I've spoke to every colleague independently <laughs> and asked who they spoke to. None of them and mentioned no one talked to him. And he's obviously in the middle of running for the state assembly, so he's got yeah. his own kind of um, his own things he's dealing with. But he said yeah. that he received an email a few days before the election uh, from a intermediary, you uh-huh. know, basically urging to support Pat Bird for mayor. Mm. So he knew it's coming. It's like now, so you use the word intermediary, but but probably others would just say a member of the public. A member of the public, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Somebody who's not one of the four that's been meeting. I mean, an intermediary, we don't know whether that person was asked to Mm -hmm. communicate that. A member um, of the public. Which would be an intermediary. Right, but whoever that member of the public was probably knew that Pat Burt's running for mayor and (laughs) that he's had those discussions. Right, right. So it's a... And that in itself to me is like a kind of on the edges of the Brown Act. I mean, four people could meet easily. Mm-hmm. But once you start pr- like kind of even sending emails through other people and you have more people kind of knowing what's to come, mm-hmm. um, you get into the kind of the blurry parts of the Yeah, the yeah. I mean, I think people yeah. who are actively involved and care about who is going to be mayor and vice mayor would take it upon themselves to say, oh, well, you know, have you spoken with uh, Schmidt about this? And if the answer is no, then I could mm-hmm. definitely see someone saying, mm-hmm, well, maybe I'll just send a little email. Right. Um, to to ask, you know, being completely uh, away from the actual candidate to just saying, well, this is, I'm taking this on myself. Well, and as your story mm-hmm. pointed out, there's, there's very subtle ways to have a conversation with a colleague um, about their vision for leadership on the council or what 2016 is going to be like, dancing around the actual question of, I want your support for the vice mayorship or the mayorship. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and the group that included, you know, Greg Scharf and Pat Bird. I mean, Greg Scharf said that he has spoken to Greg Schmidt, and he counts him as one of the people he's spoken to. Greg Schmidt is, of course, one of the four residentialists. And, you know, Greg Scharf was adamant that I didn't ask for any endorsements. We didn't discuss that. But, I mean, there might be a way to ask without asking, you know? So, yeah, yeah. And I, I do think Greg Schmidt is earnest in not wanting to get into those discussions. I mean, I've had other people who are not residentialists say that they tried to contact him, and he immediately kind of mm-hmm. said, time out, you know, can't discuss it. But, you know, no matter how hard you try, like Mark Berman, you just mm-hmm. try to insulate him, you, you, do get, you do kind of get a wind of things as they're happening. And Greg Schmidt himself knew before the vote that, you know, the challenge is up. He heard also from someone. So, you yeah. know, it, I have no reason to think that they completely kind of scoffed at the Brown Act, but, I mean, it's, 
I, I do think that you got into kind of this blurry area. At, at the very least, the spirit of the Brown Act uh, mm -hmm. was very shakily followed in this case. Yeah. Um, now, you raised a good question, Bill, earlier about whether or not, you know, the Brown Act should actually apply to this kind of topic. It's one thing to have the Brown Act um, preventing uh, collusion regarding development or um, other city topics, but when you're trying to figure out who will be the best leader for um, your group, does it, you know, does it make sense that it applies? Opening that up for both. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, we were, we talked about this we before did. we went on the air, yeah. but um, but I mean, I feel like it is important that it apply. Um, I just think it's 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 very difficult it's um, to both manage and enforce. And I think our viewers should realize that the Brown Act is one of the weakest um, sort of protective laws because, uh, first of all, it's almost impossible to ever prove that it's been violated. And second of all, the remedy for a Brown Act violation is simply the body redoing mm -hmm. the action that um, had originally taken place. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you saw this happen in Menlo Park uh, a couple of years ago where they just voted mm -hmm. again for the mayor um, in a case mm -hmm. where the victorious mayor had talked to too many people before the election. And the um, outcome was the same. Yeah. No, the outcome oh. in Menlo Park wasn't the same okay. because she chose not to, to put her name in nomination same. again. But, but I think that the danger of this is not so much the discussion about who the leaders should be, it's what goes along with that. It's what promises are being made mm -hmm. to secure your vote for me to win the mayorship or the vice mayorship um, on some other issue. I'll support you on this if you support me on that. And I think that's where it becomes problematic. And, and, and I think that the less the Brown Act applies and the less it's being followed, the bigger the advantage obviously goes to the, politi the politically minded candidates. I mean, yeah. I, I think, you know, Pat Burton and Greg Schmidt brought very different qualities to the council, each very valuable in its own way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Burt is one of the more forceful at, like, actually making motions, kind of does his homework, you know, gets a lot of these initiatives forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg Schmidt is more of, like, an ideological kind of bedrock of the residentialist. But, but the one thing that Burt is, that Schmidt isn't, is a politician, mm -hmm. which is why, I, I, you know, when I had to make a prediction of who's going to be mayor, I went with him. But, and I feel like the less the Brown Act applies, the more the politicians will be. Yeah. <laughs> the people who are, you know, kind of, who are comfortable in that kind of setting, it would definitely favor them. And yeah. depending on how you feel about that, <laughs> it's... Um, so we're talking about um, mayor and vice mayor um, without really delving into what those roles do and how much influence, I mean, how does, is this really going to affect you know, how the um, council runs, um, will it affect the decisions that are made? Because I think Eric Philseth, when you talk to him, also pointed out, well, we're the same nine people, whether or not <laughs> right. we're being led by Schmidt or Bird or, or who have you. Um, I, I think it will have some effects. It'll affect who's going to sit on committees, uh, which have some power. I mean, they make recommendations, but, uh, yeah, but they do have some influence. And I also think it's going to have a big impact on the election that's going to be happening <laughs> in November. I think that's kind of the biggest uh, fallback from this that's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I do think, uh, like... Um, how, how do you see it um, affecting the election? I do think this is a kind of another uh, a rallying cry for the residentialists. Okay. <laughs> and, like, uh, it's, I, think, I think they could use this, uh, this episode as kind of like a call for uh -huh. uh, electing more ideologically pure opponents of development. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like it might be a little harder in the future. Um, for people who are kind of on the border to uh, the pragmatists to get elected, it's mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one possible strategy, if we're, if we're totally speculating here, is that by if, if Scharf is able to successfully um, bring with Bert the council more together, and instead of having there be so much divisiveness, during the course of 2016, Whoever um, runs for council uh, under the so-called pro-development wing um, is going to have an easier time, I think, portraying themselves as not um, out of the, the mainstream. In other words, there's going to be a, a gravitation towards the middle, potentially, as a result of this odd 
couple um, in the mayor and vice mayorship. Who knows? It's possible. It's also possible that the residentialists will uh, it, will see that Greg Sharf is now slated to, to be mayor. It and, could be and, a call to action. And, for, and, yeah. and being cynical about what happened in this mayoral right. election, they could just use that as a like, as a rallying yeah. cry to get more residentialists to run, yeah. to get another That's mayor. That's equally in. as possible, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, talking about committee assignments, it was interesting that a couple of years ago when Greg Sharf was mayor, there was some uh, anxiety, I think, among the council members as to how the various committees were being, uh, the roles were being assigned, and some complaints that it was maybe weighted um, a little too heavy towards some members with the detriment of others. Yeah, and then this is one of the issues where um, Greg Scharf and Pat Burt were on opposite sides, because mm -hmm. um, uh, Greg Scharf, who was mayor in 2013, um, he, he, pre he presided at a time when many new committees were being formed. There was one about Coverly, there was one about uh, technology, mm -hmm. infrastructure, there was like, it was just a huge committee fest. Yeah. The rail committee was in existence, then it died and it just sprung up again. And many, uh, well not many, four people in the city council <laughs> uh, were excluded from most of the committee. It, uh, it was like Larry Klein, Nancy Shepard, and Greg Scharf were kind of dominating many of the committees at the time. And Pat Burt was one of the critics, and Karen Holman was another, mm -hmm. and Greg Schmidt was another, mm -hmm. because they weren't being picked. So um, yeah, there was some criticism back then. And um, and this kind of tension sort of played out in other conversations as well, which kind of helped fuel some of the kind of cynical comments we've seen when you see Scharf and Burt vote for each other and kind of each get elected. Mm -hmm. So before we move on, because I know you're about to do that probably, <laughs> um, I'm curious as to the reaction of Tom Du Bois to, to mm -hmm. what happened uh, Monday night. You quote him in your story um, as, as sounding, at least, pretty um, frustrated and, and, I guess, to some extent, hurt by what he saw happening. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit on that and, and how he reacted to the outcome. I think uh, some of us thought that he would have been the logical vice mayor um, mm -hmm. candidate and ch chose not to be nominated. Yeah, he chose not to be nominated because he says he's just too, too busy. busy, he's got a job and all that. Right. But um, yeah, like, I mean, many we've seen it all over the comments and just in speaking with many people on the phone on off the council, people suggested there was a quid pro quo, just a straight up exchange between uh, Sharp and Schmidt. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Du Bois is the only person. Sharp I'm sorry. and I'm sorry. Bird. Good correction. Yeah. Sharp and Bird. Um, so uh, t uh, Tom Du Bois kind of thinks that that was probably the case as well, and that's what, what he told me. And, and he also thinks that, um, I guess he's, he's, he's one of those people who does see the council as being strictly pro-growth residentialists and Pat kind of switch teams yeah. uh, for political expediency. I mean, I don't necessarily share that view because I don't think Pat is really in any boat. Um, but but he, but uh, but Tom also thinks that this is a precursor to the 2016 election also. and. Uh, and as kind of one of the leaders of the residentialist slate in 2014, uh, I, th I think he's going to be making the case later this year for residentialist candidates who could take on mayorship. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we will leave that there. <laughs> and we'll move to another uh, section of the city, which is the police. Um, on December 25th, Christmas night, there was a fatal shooting by police of a mentally ill man. And Sue, you were out there. Uh, yes on Forest Avenue as uh, things were going down. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what happened and what we've learned um, since about the investigation. Well, uh, unfortunately, um, this uh, man was uh, basically, you know, he had been celebrating Christmas with his, with his parents and um, he, everything seemed to be okay, more or less. Uh, but at some point he telephoned the police department uh, when he was back at the uh, residential housing facility for, um, which is through La Selva Group. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there trying to, uh, back at the house and he called um, the police department and said that there was somebody who was going to harm someone, had threatened to harm someone, and he gave a name of that person. Mm -hmm. So the police came out and um, when they arrived on the darkened street, he came out from bushes apparently and began screaming, uh, did not utter any uh, intelligible words, and was waving around a, um, what looked like be a sharp object. And uh, at, in, in a matter of about 19 seconds, he rushed the police with the sharp object, and they shot him and killed him. So they arrived, and then 19 seconds later was the shooting? Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, it's an unfortunate situation. It's not one that 
The police did not release very much information about it. The street was closed off for, for many hours. There were witnesses. There were maybe about three or four people who actually went down to the police department thereafter and gave statements. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, you know, there, some people are, are including um, parents of William Raff are saying they believe that uh, there was excessive force used. Mm -hmm. uh, police say that they have video that shows from beginning to end. They said they're very fortunate because in a lot of these types of cases, you don't have video, but they have several, or you only have little bits of video. They have the entire incident from beginning to end. Because there are cameras mounted on police cars. On, on police cars, as opposed to, they, they didn't have the body cameras on, but they did have police, uh, the cameras of the cars. Yeah. Uh, so this incident raises a lot of different questions, um, use of force, um, the kind of training that police receive, and then also um, what kind of information is released to the public, what can be released, what must be released right. um, under the um, Public Records Act. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the use of force. Um, first of all, I mean, some people immediately were questioning, okay, why was he shot? Why wasn't he tased? Why were there right. rubber bullets? What was, right. what was the scenario? And, Right. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, the police did call in for backup for, um, for rubber bullets. That's one of the things that they <coughs> said that they did. But mm -hmm. it just didn't, it all came down so fast they didn't have a chance to do anything. Why they didn't use tasers, I don't know. Other than that, once again, they just said um, it, it just all happened so fast. Was there not one? They did use taser. There was oh, they one, did use one. one. Oh, that's one right. One of the three right. officers. That's right. There were three officers and one did, did use a taser. But, mm -hmm. um, Apparently, he, uh, he was so close to one of the officers when he was shot that the officer had to move out of the way when he fell. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the main thing in terms of use of force is I think this is a question nationally about the you know, use of force with police. We've seen incidents all over the country um, which people believe that the police used excessive force right. and it's often been, you know, often been proven to be true. Yeah, much so, discussed, yeah, much so, discussed topic. Yeah, so um, I think in this case that, you know, it's just beg the same questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's not usual. I think 2002 was the last time mm -hmm. that there was a shooting um, in Palo Alto. Fatal shooting. Fatal shooting with, um, by the police of a yeah. person. Yeah. So. Janata, you looked at the use of force um, mm -hmm. policy um, and wrote about that. Um, what can you tell us about, like, the circumstances and the procedures, what they kind of should be following. Well, yes. Um, well, use of force, including deadly force, is allowed if there's, like, if, if a police officer could reasonably conclude that um, the person that they're using the force on presents danger. Mm -hmm. And there's a list of kind of like, there's a pretty long list of circumstances that they could consider mm -hmm. uh, before doing so. These include, um, like, the, the person they're dealing with, mental state, whether that whether they deem this person to be a danger to himself, to other people, whether danger to officers. And many of the things um, that are listed here mm -hmm. do seem to directly apply in this case, which is why I'd be very careful to distance um, this episode from what we've seen in, in, in other parts exactly. of the national debate where the circumstances are very, very different. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you talk about right. Ferguson to me, Rice. I mean, th this, this mm -hmm. is a person who's mm -hmm. got a knife and charging at police. Right. You know, I can't definitively say without having seen the video whether mm -hmm. it's been excessive or not. But ju but just looking at the police department's policy and the kind of circumstances in which they would be allowed to do it, uh, many of the uh, kind of circumstances of this incident, as described by the police, do seem to suggest that you know officers did have you know at least uh, some reason to fear for their safety and uh, kind of do what they did, unfortunate as it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my understanding in terms of um, training of officers is that you know there are some people who on Town Square who questioned why didn't they shoot, you know, um, William Raff, unfortunately, you know, to disable him instead of to kill him. But I understand that the training is, well, it's supposed to be deadly because, right. I mean, you know, well, they're supposed yeah. to be stopping the person. Yeah. Well, I talked to Zach Brun about that mm -hmm. um, at the police department, and he basically said the training, they are, they are trained to shoot for the largest mass mm -hmm. and to stop the target. Whatever it is that's coming at them, that's what they do. They don't even aim for someone's head because that's too small of a target. That's what they mm -hmm. said. It's not realistic to expect um, an officer to shoot someone in the leg or the arm. It's just if someone's that close, 20 feet is an area, a, a space that could be closed very quickly. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, it's just not realistic to expect that you can stop someone. You don't stop someone. Mm -hmm. And they said, if you have, you know, there are some incidents in which 
you know, you read about a cop shot the gun right out of somebody's hand, but they said that person is stationary. They're not moving. They're mm -hmm. not a moving target running towards you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the reason why they felt they, they just didn't really have a choice. Okay. And it also seems like a kind of a blink of an eye decision. I mean, if, if the person is that close to you that you have to duck, right. uh, who's following you, it's like, yeah. I can't imagine there's that much time to think about, you know, which way to shoot. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Well, um, we talked a little bit about the video. I know um, there are a lot of questions about um, the use of, um, the use and the access to videos that are either mounted on uh, the officers' bodies or on cameras because uh, part of the reason for doing so is just to, for the, we, I think there's a common idea that the public is supposed to be able to see what actually happens and it should be clarifying um, situations. Um, however, <laughs> as we're, we've been looking into this um, story, it seems like there, there are a number of exemptions to what can be released to the public um, under the clause of um, it being part of the investigation, investigatory files, which is under the Public Records Act. Um, cameras and recordings fall under that um, as long as they're claimed under the investigation. Is that not correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, this kind of varies from state to state, and mm -hmm. California law for public records really does give uh, police a lot of discretion not to release any files relating to investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, 6254F, that's, that's a section right. of government code, <laughs> and it pretty much says if it's related to an investigation, uh, you could pretty much withhold it. I mean, but, the, but let's make yeah. make clear that that's a permissive exemption. Oh, they, they could it, release it if they want right. to. They're just not required to. Exactly. Correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If a police officer says I can't release it because of the law, that's not true. But if they say I'm not required to release it, that is true. And and even when the investigation is over, they could hold on to it forever. So yeah, it's, it's permanent um, exemption. Unfortunately, in California, the laws such as they may, we may never see the video. Yeah. It's, um, there are a number of things that um, are excluded from the exemption, which it means that the police are supposed to release it, name uh, the um, involved person, ad address, description, a um, whole list of things. I found it interesting that um, that included like all diagrams and statements of uh, people who witnessed the incident, um, things like that. So there's information that is contained within records that um, the public can ask for, even though the public can't ask for the specific record itself, such as we can't, we may not be able to see um, the video if the police department does not choose to release the video, but we can certainly ask what is on the video. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of, that's my understanding of um, 6254F. <laughs> um, but that kind of, I mean, it's just a very gray area in, uh, in working with the police department because, you know, they're, uh, they don't have to, in some cases, release stuff, but as Bill was just pointing out, they could. They could for the sake of um, being transparent with the public. Yeah, I think, I think this poses more of a public relations question than it does a legal question. If, mm -hmm. if, um, if there was a surviving suspect and there was a, a likely court proceeding or prosecution, there's much greater reason to, to hold on to this evidence until the prosecution takes place. Um, in this situation, the only possible, which is far-fetched, prosecution would be against the officers. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. of course, the district attorney's office is conducting an investigation to determine whether there is any reason to right. believe that something was done improperly by the police. But that, I think, I don't think anybody is, thinks that that's likely. So really then at, at that point it's a question of well, what's in the public interest, the broad public interest. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly it would seem as though, uh, especially in a community with the relatively progressive uh, policing policies that Dennis Burns has brought to the department, that the department would want to be sharing this information. Um, that it would open a window into the challenges that their officers face in a situation like this. So even though they probably have the legal right to prevent this from coming out, I'm reasonably confident that at the right, you know, at, a, at, at some point when the DA's office is done with this, mm -hmm. they will um, release the tape. And, and my sense is also that, like you say, they're going to wait till the investigation is complete. And then we'll see what happens after that. And I think that one of the things that I do know is that it's a very difficult um, video to look at. And that's what the police told me. That's what uh, Zach Perron told me. So he said, as difficult as it is to look at, 
you know, they're glad that they have all of the pieces of it mm -hmm. because of what it shows. So I'm hopeful that maybe they will show that just to leave everybody as well. Well, and I think that what's what we've seen in other parts of the country is that those um, police agencies and district attorneys that rapidly release information about police shootings, including video, they wind up with far fewer problems down the road with both public violent public reaction, which is not likely to take place in this situation, but also just their image in the community. So it might not be a pretty thing to look at, but. Um, that transparency, I think, goes a long way. And I, th and I think that um, the Palo Alto Police Department is not closing the door and releasing the video, but it's, as you said, it's because of the investigation and the fact that DA still hasn't seen it. Uh, that's kind of the reason they gave me for not... Uh, for, yeah, for, but for why, you know, why hasn't the DA seen it? I mean, that's it. <laughs> you know, how long does it take to watch 17 seconds of video? Uh, I, I don't believe that the DA's office has not looked at that video and what we're really in is an intentional kind of waiting period to let the emotions settle down. Are we assuming that the Palo Alto Police Department has completed its own investigation completely? Because the sequence was they get done, then it goes to the DA. They don't really do it concurrently. Well, so, I understood from Sue's reporting that it was concurrent, that they, when you have an officer involved shooting, they immediately the outside agencies brought in to, to, to do a parallel investigation. Oh, my, yeah, it's, my it's, not clear, it's not clear to me whether it was going to be parallel or they, or they were going to wait until the police department finished theirs. My understanding uh, in talking to the DA's office afterwards is it does appear that they'll wait until they get all of, all of the evidence, too. everything oh, okay. put together. Uh, the way the initial press release was put out by the police department did sound like it was concurrent. It sounded as though they were going to be partnering on it, but apparently right. that's not what they The second press it. release made it seem like yeah. they will hand over all the information after, yeah. the crim after the criminal investigation to the DA, and then after the administrator investigation, they're going to hand it over to Michael Giannaco. Hmm. Well, that surprises which, me which because be you would think that you'd want a, an outside agency right there at the beginning yeah. conducting interviews before everybody's had a chance to that's you know, one of the things that circle the wagon, so that's to speak. That's one of the things they're not doing. Is they're ba it sounds as though they're basically not going out on their own to do these investigations separately uh, and independently of the police department, but rather taking what the police department presents to them, and then they're going to look that over. So it doesn't sound like it's going to go any further than, than that in terms of their own investigation. Although they did say that it might be, it usually takes about 60 days by the time they'll be done with it, uh, from the DA's perspective. They said thereafter it might take a little bit longer if there are other questions that are raised that they need to investigate. So from that perspective, one of the things that I think in terms of public perception is that we do have uh, so much going on now with social media where people are just out there with their, mm -hmm. you know, their cell phones. I'm surprised there's not video of this from a cell phone. Yeah, and, and who knows, there may be, but I haven't heard of any. Mm -hmm. But, and nobody's come forward. And when I've tried to approach people who were witnesses, they just ran from me and, you know, went, ran into their homes and just locked their doors. Mm. So it was a little bit intimidating. Tired of the media. And also, yeah. this, this doesn't so. take place in a particularly dense area. I mean, it's like yeah. late at night in the dark, a little corner on Forest Avenue, and yeah. it takes 19 seconds. I mean, you'd have to be pretty well positioned with your camera to capture that they're going to sell. Well, I think people were just sort of sauntering down the street on their way home, you know, from their mm -hmm. celebrations, and then just happened upon it. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. basically what, mm -hmm. what they saw. So yeah. they probably yeah. weren't. It wasn't like they had a chance to heard heard a commotion and stuck their phone out the window like a Rodney King beam yeah. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Probably taking me more than nineteen seconds just to pull out the phone and <laughs> yeah. start start recording. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, true. Well, and people aren't ready for the trauma of you know dealing exactly. with this. So. Well, and we should acknowledge the trauma to the department and those officers um, yes. because that can't be an easy thing to um, to show up at the scene of an incident described as it had been described and then to have it wind up in a matter of seconds with a dead body. Um, and, I, and, I, and that's very true. And, and in, uh, in talking to Zach, it's also, he said that they, they, you know, he couldn't really comment on their state of mind, but he said, as you can imagine, they're, they're mm -hmm. devastating, yeah. basically. And, and, that, um, and so there's never any amount of training that can ever really prepare you for something like that. And to find out that the person was severely mentally ill and you know, it wasn't really a, like a bad guy, uh, didn't have like a long criminal history yeah. of doing bad things to people. <coughs> it makes it all, all that much really Yeah. 
Well, there's more to report on that story, and we will be doing that um, in the weeks and months to come. So thanks very much. Um, we'll wrap up this edition of Behind the Headlines. Um, you can always follow the news uh, in Palo Alto on www.paloaltoonline.com. Thanks.